Okay, so let's start. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Nicolas Fleury, uh, and I'm here with uh, Mathieu Nerol. Uh, we both work at Ubisoft Montreal. Uh, as programmers, we do a lot of things to try to prevent bugs. Uh, we make code reviews, uh, we make unit tests, we make functional tests. We use static analyzers like Clank ID, Coverity, etc. But we still make bugs. So we're uh, your testers, uh, but we still have bugs reaching our consumers, so we make beta versions. Or in the case of games like Rainbow Six Siege, we make test servers so that some players can play the game before its official release. So today we want to introduce you one more approach that we're trying to uh, try to prevent bugs. Um, I'm a technical architect on Rainbow Six Siege, while Mathieu is a technical architect in the technology group. Um, He's from an academic background, and what he's doing at Ubisoft is pretty much a continuity of what he did during his PhD. And today we'll show how the system is working. How we identify buggy commits uh, from the past, how we match some code contributions with past bugs, and how we use machine learning to predict the riskiness of a commit. Then I'll come back and discuss the application on Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, this tech is not specific to Rainbow Six Siege, it's just this is the project um, with which we are testing the tech at Ubisoft. So we'll first uh, discuss the bug introduction rate on Rainbow Six, and then I will conclude on some tools and the code fixes suggestions from the tool. So I'm leaving you for, with Mathieu for now. So, hi everyone. First, let's have a look at how do we know that a commit did introduce a bug in the past. So on any software project, you will have commits incoming in, represented by those little squares, and then at some point, you will have an issue uh, getting logged into your issue database. Could be GUI, could be anything. That issue will be fixed by a fixed commit, and at, from this point on, we can start uh, learning about our practices, learning about how we work, in a sense that we can perform blame operation on that fixed commit to determine which commit did introduce the bug in the first place. Of course, this bug fix pattern occurs again and again uh, in the project, and if you're working in a big company like Ubisoft, it also occurs across many projects that are going on at the same time. In the end, what we want to know if it's if the yellow commits that are about to be pushed into your Git repository or Fairforce repositories are introducing a new defect inside your systems. So what we do is we are comparing your new contribution with every interesting past uh, signature that we know introduced a bug. And if we find a match with your code contribution and a past bug, we try to feed you the fix that was applied to that uh, past bug. And for reference, in big open source systems, such as uh, the one produced by the Apache Foundation, uh, Mozilla Foundation, Eclipse Foundation, you can find a bug introduction rate of around 23%. So let's have a look at some code. For the sake of the arguments, let's say that one of your developers uh, did introduce a faulty bubble sort. In that bubble sort, the uh, termination condition of your inner four isn't correct. In here, you don't want uh, less than one minute G. You want a proper termination condition. And still for the sake of the argument, let's say that another developer in another project fixed another bugged bubble sort, but that bubble sort is a while-based bubble sort. Here, you have uh, the fix, which is applying the proper termination condition for the four, with uh, i less than n minus g. So what we do is that we abstract that piece of code by replacing all the variable names and all the function names by constant name of our own. And then when the code is abstracted, we can compare it to the buggy double four bubble sort and find some similarities between uh, the buggy version of the bubble sorts and the fixed version of the bubble sorts. So in the end, what we can do is take the fix that was applied to the wild-based bubble sort and merge it with your buggy double four-based bubble sort. 
we don't compare code as text. We do it with abstract syntax trees. So on the top, you have the abstract syntax tree of the buggy double, double four bubble sort. In the middle, the wild base uh, fixed bubble sort. And in the end, the fix of the wild base bubble sort merged into the double four uh, base bubble sort. Now, we are working on diffs. So diffs are not complete pieces of code. And on a diff, you couldn't have a complete AST. So what we use instead are partial abstract uh, partial abstract syntax trees. And because we are abstracting the values of the node of the IST, we end up working with partial abstracted abstract syntax trees. And here, if you zoom in within the tree, you can see what we have been doing with your code uh, contribution. So we've been removing some of your token, we've been removing some of your identifier names, and we replace those by the one we found on the fix of the wild base bubble sort. So if we move away from the bubble sort example and we try to look at a general example of how this tech works, let's say that you have your code contribution, which is a partial abstracted abstract syntax tree, A, B, C, D, A, G, and that code contribution matches a known bug. That known bug has been fixed by a fixed commit, and the operation applied on the known bug tree were to delay the E node and to move the B node and to update some of the values of the C node and the A node. So what we do is that we take the operation applied to go from the buggy tree to the fixed tree, and we apply those operations again into your code contribution. In the end, what you have is a new proposition uh, that you can take or leave, and that proposition uh, tries to uh, propose you uh, a change which, which is less risky uh, to be made. So a few times already I said that we compare your code contribution with interesting past uh, bugs. But what do we mean by interesting? What's an interesting past bug? So first, what we do is that we try to find projects that looks like yours within Ubisoft. So here, you have 12 AAA games that have been shipped by Ubisoft, and those are the yellow dots. All of those games have dependencies, and these dependencies are the blue dot. And the rationale here, the idea behind this, is that if you share the same dependencies as another project, you are likely to be open to the same flaws because you are likely to be trying to do things the same way. A dependency can be uh, the game engine, for sure. It can be our matchmaking tech. It can be external dependencies, such as 7-zip, or stuff like that. When you cluster those projects according to their dependency, you end up with uh, groups of projects. In here, each color represents one group. So if you do a code contribution inside the blue cluster, I'm only gonna look for interesting bugs, bugs inside other projects that are inside the blue clusters uh, because they are projects that looks like yours. So now that we have that, we could, for each and every contribution, uh, apply these techniques, but we don't want to do that. We want to go and look for past bugs that looks like your contribution only if your contribution is a risky one, if your contribution has a high likelihood of introducing a new defect inside our systems. So to compute that likelihood of a contribution to introduce a defect, we use machine learning. So the gist of machine learning is that you have a lot of historical data that are numerical data, and you try to model out this data using some uh, machine learning techniques, and when you have new data, unseen data, you can try to make a prediction about this data. So in our case, the prediction will be, is this commit likely to introduce a bug or not? Is it a buggy commit or is it a sane commit? Of course, it's a prediction, so we can be wrong. Here you can see that all the data are numerical data. But if you think about a dish, there is no much uh, numerical data about a dish. So where do we find those? We find those, for example, in uh, the stability of a subsystem. Uh, the regions 
of the subsystem. How many lines have been added? How many lines have been deleted? And all of these numerical data are known as machine learning features. So a feature in machine learning is just a numerical data that we are going to use to model what we are trying to predict. So in our case, to model uh, commits and the riskiness of a commit. Some of the machine learning we, uh, features we use, the age of the files, the number of files, the number of directories, the relative experience of a developer with regard to the repository, the relative experience of a developer with regard to the subsystem, and many more uh, features that we do use on each contribution to compute the likelihood of that contribution to introduce a new defect. So with all of these uh, machine learning features, you can build a feature matrix. For all of the commits, you will have feature A to feature M, and then in the end, you will have also a class for each commit. The class is a buggy or sane. Did this commit introduce a defect or not? And we do know if a commit introduces a defect using the same algorithm we uh, presented before. So if you want to visualize the riskiness of your commit on a graph, and you take only two features, let's say the lines added and the number of devs that touch the file, you can have something like this, and you can even draw a best fit function on this to try to model out your data. If you take three features, uh, you can still modeling uh, model the three features with line added, line deleted, and devs, for example, and you can add a plan in this uh, representation to have um, your data modeled out. But if you go on and you push with our 40 plus features, then you will have problem to visualize it. Okay, beyond 3D, you can't just draw a graph. So what you can do here is to use a covariance matrix, and the covariance matrix will try to bag in together features that seems to be pushing in the same direction. So if you have two features that are pushing into the whiskey net, you will bag them together, and two features that are pushing onto the sanity of a commit, they will, you will bag them together. You do this recursively until you have only two dimensions. So if you have simple data, you can use simple techniques, such as linear regression. Here you have a linear regression on data that, and the linear regression is trying to find the best regression formula to model your data out. If you have more complex data, however, the linear regression won't help you. Let's say we are trying to model uh, that curve, and what we can use are decision trees. On decision trees, for each step of the decision tree, you will have a feature and a threshold. If you are, the value of the feature is above the threshold, you will go right, and if you are below, you will go left. And then on the curve, every 90 degree angle you can see correspond to a turn within the tree. So you see it's kind of working. You are trying to, modeling, to model out your data, but it's not perfect. So what you can do is uh, train many more trees, but for each of these trees, you are giving them a different starting condition. So you will have similar trees, but they are not exactly the same in the end. And you can continue to do that with many more trees, and in the end, you do the average of every tree, and you will have a good model for your data. Of course, machine learning trees can go uh, deep, and you, will, you can end up with 300, 400, 500 steps within your trees when you have uh, many dimensions to be modeled. So what about performances of our algorithm? For now, we have a 70% precision. The precision is the rate of first alarm, if you will, uh, within the algorithm. So it means that for every alarm the systems give you is right 70% of the time meaning 30% of the alarms are false alarms. And we have a recall of 71%. So the recall is on all the, all, all the commits that did introduce a bug, how many did we manage to flag? So we managed to flag 71% of the commits that did introduce a bug in the end. 
if we, for the sake of simplicity, take 70% precision and 70% recall with a simple data set on the right, where you have 10 buggy commits and 10 sane commits with 70% precision and 70% recall, you will have been able to correctly flag seven buggy commits out of 10 at the cost of misclassifying three sane commits out of the 10. Now, if you look like at the real data of Rainbow Six Siege, it looks something like this. So in red are buggy commits, and in blue, sane commits. And there is many interesting things to say about this graph, but one of them is that you see the red arrows that models out buggy commits seems to be uh, greater than the blue arrows, and they are. And in fact, it tells us that in this 2D flattening of our 4TD uh, matrix, it's much, much easier to do a buggy commit than to do a sane commit, because the classifiers uh, tells you that there is much area to be uh, classified as uh, buggy. Also, it looks like the classifiers only draw straight lines across the 2D space, but if you zoom in inside the classifier, you will find something like this. So the darker the shade of color, the more certain we are that the commit is either buggy or uh, sane. As you can see, it's not perfect. So there is red dot into blue areas and blue dot into red areas, but overall, what we managed to have is 70% precision and 71% recall. So now with all of this, you can have a likelihood of a commit to be, uh, to introduce a commit uh, bug inside your systems. Here you can see the distribution of the riskiness of the commits made on Rainbow Six Siege for the last eight weeks or so, and the median riskiness for those commits is 24%, and we decided to try to find you interesting past bugs and fixes when the riskiness of your contribution to introduce a new bug is above 50%. And this represents only 5% of the total commits made in the last eight uh, weeks. We didn't choose that number randomly. What we did is that we look once again at, at the number, and here what you can see is the effectiveness of each riskiness range so between zero and 10% of riskiness, you introduce a bug in average in 1.45% of the cases. But if you look down the table and you go into the 50 to 60% uh, range of riskiness, then you will have 68% chance of actually introducing a bug. So to sum up uh, what's going on, first you do a cut contribution a commit, that, that commit is fetched by a pre-commit hook. From, the, from there, we compute our machine learning vector, which is composed of our different features. We do the classification. If the classification returns something greater than a 50% risk of introducing a new uh, defect, we go on and we compute the partial abstracted abstract syntax tree of your diff, and we try to match it with known uh, bug fixes. If we do find another fix for you, we propose you the fix, and we learn from accepted proposition. So you can see there, there is two boxes in red. Those two boxes are in red because we are currently working on this. So this part where we actually propose the fix to the developer, and when we learn if uh, what kind of suggestions are likely to be accepted by your devs, are not live yet. The parts who are live are the one uh, for the riskiness prediction. So we have been working on this for quite a long time, and you can find all the theoretical background on laforge.ubisoft.com. Now keep in mind that the most up-to-date and the most advanced version of this work uh, is the one we are presenting today. So now back to Nick to have some uh, Statistics on Rainbow Six Siege. So thanks, Matthew. Um, so Rainbow Six Siege, uh, if you don't know the game, uh, it's a first-person shooter with the main mode being five versus five. 
uh, online game that was released in December, December 2015. Uh, the game is still very alive. Uh, we have reached over 35 million players, and we have around 3 million players playing the game each day. Um, multiple gaming sites uh, elected the game as the most improved game of 2017. Uh, we still have a lot of things we still want to improve. Um, so to do this, it takes a lot of people, uh, especially with a game that is live. Uh, we have over 600 people working full-time on the game. And if we talk about people uh, with professions related to the subject of this talk, we have around 200 testers full-time on the game and around 150 programmers. On these programmers, around 100 are working in the game code itself. The other programmers working in the tools to make the content or all the online infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. Uh, as developers, we understand that change and stability are kind of two opposing forces. So it's a challenge to be able to change a lot of things while keeping the bug count low. So how are we doing on Rainbow Six? Uh, if we look during the production of the game, our bug introduction rate was around 50%. Uh, it sounds big. Uh, it means for every two submit, we introduce on average one more bug entry in the database. Of course, it's possible for submit to introduce multiple bugs. Um, also, for crashes, we use part of the call stack as an ID. And sometimes that could be slightly too big, and it means that the same crash will result in multiple crash IDs. Uh, and one more thing to note is that some bugs in video game development are kind of normal iterative work. You know, you could have a bug saying the shooting for that gun, that character doesn't feel right, you want to improve it. Sometimes you can do it in data, but sometimes you will modify code as well. Um, so as we ship the game, the white line being the ship date, uh, we see the number of bug inventory going down as we concentrate on fixes. Uh, we see a white line uh, close to 25%. This is what Mathieu measure as an average for big open source projects. So we look at that and we're saying, oh, maybe we can do better. Um, then the game is released and we release season. So the other white lines are season. So Rainbow Six Siege, every three months, uh, we fork our main branch, our main trunk, uh, and stabilize it for maybe one month and a half, and then we ship it to players. So we introduce new characters that have new gadgets and other features in the game. Uh, and we can see that as we learn to work on a live game, we seem to be more and more able to introduce flex bugs per commit. But then, in 2017, the curve is going up. Back in the day, there were multiple people on the project saying that we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, we didn't have these exact numbers, but we had not under numbers showing the same trend. If we wanted that game to live for five years, 10 years, we had an issue. So we had really good discussions internally. Um, and then we proposed to the Eternal in Paris to basically skip a season to dedicate it to stability of the game. Internally, we will also refactor some systems so that they can survive better on long term and also introduce much more uh, functional tests. And from that moment, uh, Paris accepted, so Operation Health was announced to the players. Uh, and we can see that we managed to change the trend and the curve is now uh, continuously going down. Uh, we've been able to go under 25% or the 22% for big open source projects. Uh, we keep in mind that the end of the curve is probably higher because we'll find, we'll fix bugs in the future in the code that was just submitted, for sure. Uh, but I, I, I'm pretty confident that still the curve is, is going in the right direction. Uh, when it comes to the risk factor that uh, Matthew mentioned, we reintrodu uh, recently introduced it in our submit system that we use to submit code. Um, that is that if the percentage is big enough, uh, we'll strongly suggest the programmer to make a test with a tester. But uh, one issue we have is often programmers, when they ask for tests, they don't specify that much what to test, maybe because they want to play safe. Uh, so another thing we did, based on the same information from the system, is to look at the bugs from the past associated to the files and the changes. And then we use natural language processing to summarize these into sentences to give hints to the tester that thing maybe you should look at first. But then what about the code fixes suggestions, right? This is the, where the tech is the most promising. Uh, I'm just starting to have my hands on it. Uh, and so far my feeling is that it's like a non-programmer giving you programming advice. 
but that non-programmer have seen a lot of code. So it can suggest very stupid things and very insightful things. For example, here we have a function and the system is telling you, hey, you should add a third argument here and pass false. You look at the function definition, it doesn't even take three arguments. <laughs> uh, of course, this is something we can reinforce and you know, it can improve over time. But then you have one more example and you say, it's saying, hey, you know that function, you should actually pass false as a second argument. The system is giving you the change list it's using as a reference from the past where you know, it's used to disuse that this is probably a bug. Look at the change list, you look at the code, and it's a real bug. And it's not that passing false or passing true to that function is always wrong. It's that it looked at the code around this call and found a similar match from something that was fixed in the past. I really like this example because this is kind of showing knowledge of the code base. Uh, other examples, they, they strongly look like they use guidelines from the code base. But you could argue that maybe in these cases, maybe it's better to code a, a custom clang ID validation maybe. Uh, but this one, it's, this, this is pretty unique. And I see a lot, a lot of potential in this. When I think about it, a lot of the bugs we see in code reviews, they often fit in a single function. So which means that that's pretty good for these kind of system that are not analyzing relatively smart, uh, small code patterns. And then when it comes to performance improvements, we see a lot of things in a single function. Um, these actually are not bugs, so we, this is something where we need to maybe reinforce the system to want them. Uh, this is things I've mentioned in past uh, CPVCon talks, but you know, missing reserve calls to STD vector-like containers, uh, wrong big O, uh, notation algorithm being chosen. Uh, for example, here someone is removing elements from an STD vector-like uh, container, and if it thinks preserving order and you remove multiple ones, then it's actually faster to call the wrapper over std remove if. Uh, bad usage of heap, well, I should a use less usage of heap, but in the game industry, use less usage of heap is a bad usage of heap. Um, so this is, again, things that we mentioned in past if you can talk, in place area in Savare, if you prefer small vector, uh, in place function instead of a std function, uh, in place thing uh, instead of string. The idea is that even if your string class has SSO buffer, you can have a subclass with uh, public inheritance, and if the first bytes of the SSO buffer are zero, you can interpret it completely differently, and your in place subclass can actually extend the SSO buffer. So instead of having no allocation, uh, only when it fits in the SSO buffer, you can then uh, change code to even remove the allocations, uh, allocations for bigger uh, strings as well. But anyway, in the end, uh, my biggest concern is will false positive ruin that system? Uh, I know that programmers, they don't like system with a lot of false positives, and this one has false positive by design. Um, so it's still, we still need to see how it will react well on reinforcements as we tell it, no, no this is wrong, this is wrong, or this is right. Uh, we'll see, uh, we're just starting uh, playing with it. Um, and that's it, I, I see a lot of potential, and we have one minute for, our, for questions now. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Um, regarding the data that you feed into the learning algorithm, um, would it make sense to provide artificial data for it from, let's say, books of health shutter or uh, all the consultants where they say this is a bug and this is how it could be fixed? And that might be uh, improving the quality of the data that you're learning on? Yeah, actually, we have the possibility to feed patterns to the system already. So if you have a small uh, bug fix pattern that you don't want to see at all on your system, you can feed it and it becomes a hard wall that you, you should avoid. And also, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the the training data for this, uh, did you manually go through every single bug fix and find the commit that introduced the bug? It seems like a lot of work, or did you? Uh, do something actually, clever? there is an algorithm called the SZZ algorithm, and uh, what it does is exactly this. So it will form the fixed commit, and we know it's a fixed commit because it was being used to fix an issue. It, it will give you which part of which commit did introduce this in the first place. It's like automated blame operation, so you know which one did introduce the bug. And then 
you replay the, your ball history and you know uh, which one to feed and which one to, to raise. Thanks. How hard is it to avoid the desire to use something like this to measure individual programmer performance to say, hey, look, <laughs> you introduce far too many bugs in code that should be pretty easy not to introduce bugs. I, I can take this one. Um, more code. We had pretty good discussion internally about this. And actually, in Canada, you cannot use automated measurements to fire anyone. Um, hey, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have to remove completely users from the features. Um, actually, maybe you can talk about how users were effective at predicting bugs or not. Um, actually, uh, when you are done building your model, you can see which feature are the one that uh, weighed the most. And the users weren't even that high. Like if I take the user ID, it wasn't accounting for so much into the prediction. So we're moving it completely uh, to play it safe and to be sure that no one uses this data to fire someone uh, that did affect the precision by less than a percent. So we did remove it in the end. Um, yeah, so uh, earlier you had mentioned that you have a 70% uh, precision rate. Is this before, uh, looking at the commits before they're thrown into unit testing and automation in CI? Afterwards, is it used conjunction? Does that affect your results? So um, it was after being submitted, but to be honest, we're, we're not really good at testing at automated testing back in the day were still not that great. So that was everything submitted. But the, the riskiness of a commit will go down as the time passes because we, uh, as it has been as long, uh, long enough inside your system to be discovered uh, in the, the, the future. So as soon as your commit came in, it gets a riskiness factor. And this riskiness factor can go down if, by, for example, your commits got overridden by another commit or if it has been deployed on a test server or something like that. But the, the first riskiness uh, computation is at submit time. So when the developer wants to push it through. OK. And uh, does it work on merge commits as well, given that that's increment or uh, adding a bunch of different features? Yeah, it could be a merge, integration, whatever. It, it will give you a riskiness factor. Thank you. So um, I have uh, one uh, big uh, question. It's actually two connected questions uh, again about the, the developer human factor uh, that uh, directly connect with the second part of the talk and uh, kind of goes from the purpose of your, your the first part, part of the talk. So uh, again, and the, with this you know human developer factor, if you have. Uh, uh, noticed a trend, or you know, and developers can see trends. That you know, there's some developers that produce commits that are, uh, you know, that a lot of false positives or uh, something that actually works, but the system says it's a bug or other way around. But the quality, but it doesn't, you know, reflect on the overall quality of, you know, the their the, the job and in 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 the end. Uh, so I mean, wouldn't. So the, the purpose of it is kind of implicitly and the system seems very useful, but I mean, it still certainly may not be very clear, you know, how it gonna affect, will 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 be helpful in the end, like will will we'll improve things because, you know, it, it may be counterintuitive that, you know, it, it, it looks as uh, some people are actually uh, doing worse than, than, than they are in reality. And uh, to measure that, um, going to the second part of the talk, I mean, you, you need to like more data, obviously. I mean, uh, so when you introduce a system, I mean, the developer may change their behavior and, you know, you're just right, you know, so obviously smaller, smaller commits or, or, you know, and, uh, you know, there's, you, you can't measure it just, just in that for graphics, like, you know, into, with, with two, you know, in, in two dimensions, so you also need all the data, data to account for that. You know, what kind of the commits are like in a development cycle. So, I mean, it does, uh, otherwise, it doesn't. You know, without this context, it doesn't really, you know, tell anything. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure which one of the question I should answer first, but maybe we can take it afterwards because we have a bleeping lights of ten seconds that we have to leave now. But uh, afterwards, yeah, let's we'll, discuss uh, we'll uh, around here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.